Is that better? <laughs> uh, I have to apologize for our Dayglow logo on here. I'm not quite sure why it turned out to be pink and brown. It's not what it's supposed to look like, but anyway, I, don't, I can't fix it now, so. Um, sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> See, they're going down now. <laughs> so uh, in the last uh, couple of years, um, I've been lucky enough to attend uh, a couple of, well, three um, conferences on snakebite, which basically uh, physicians and other medical personnel, as well as herpetologists, uh, getting together to discuss uh, new, basically the newest information on snakebite, and uh, also attended a conference called Exogenous Factors Affecting Thrombosis and Hemostasis, which you can try saying fast ten times if you want. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> That was just this, uh, this past summer, and basically what that title means, translated, is uh, how venoms are used um, in research. So it's basically people looking at structure and looking at um, specifically how individual toxins work uh, in the body. So it was really interesting, even though I probably understood about a third of what was going on in it. All right, now I'm told if I hit the screen, Ooh, it's going to change. I've used this screen. So. It made that come up. Not sure. All right. I just move this. Yeah. Okay. So, what I've done for this talk is basically take uh, other speakers. I've got their name up at the top of each slide. Um, and kind of consolidate what I thought might be the most interesting to people in herb societies or herpers. And, uh, that's what you'll see. So you'll see the name up at the top. That's the person who really deserves the credit for this. I'm just trying to translate it for you guys. So the first thing I wanted to mention is the Global Snake Bite Initiative. And I really think this is something that's kind of important for uh, people in the herp community to know about. Um, in the last, I don't know, this has been a couple of years now since it was put on the list of neglected tropical diseases. And IST, which is the International Society on Toxicology, um, started the um, Global Snake Bite Initiative with the World Health Organization. And basically, they are looking for ways to reduce uh, injury and death from snake bite around the world, especially in tropical uh, regions. And so they're looking at, there's kind of like these three uh, main focuses that they have. The first one is antivenom. Um, there are some places that don't have an antivenom that's produced in the country. Um, an example of this is in some uh, African countries, the only anti-serum available is actually from India. And if your family member gets bitten by a snake, you have to take them to the hospital. You have to uh, pay when you get to the hospital. And then you have to go down to the market and try to find some anti-serum. And there are people selling the anti-serum. Some of it is real anti-serum that will work on, the, on your family member. Some of it is real anti-serum, but it's for the wrong snake, and it isn't going to work. And some of it is garbage. And there's really no good way for someone who's not a physician to tell which is which. And um, some of the talks on this are just devastating to listen to. I mean, to think these you know, people in this horrible situation trying to help their loved one, and they have a very difficult time. There's a lot of roadblocks. So one of the main focuses is getting production and um, getting it available to people so that if you're bitten, no matter where you are, there's antivenom available to you. And then also making sure that if they do produce a new antiserum, that it's actually tested and make sure that it works before it's actually used on people. Second aspect is training, um, especially in a lot of developing countries. Um, medical care might not be at the standard as what we're used to here in the United States or in other developed countries. And so uh, there's actually a, a snake bite like university you can go to in Australia. They have a class every year. I'm hoping to go one someday. Um, and uh, they basically take people from anywhere in the world, the other medical personnel, and train them. And it's a real hands-on, kind of problem-based uh, course that they're doing. It, it's really cool. It looks like a lot of fun. And uh, the last thing that they're looking at is um, access. So again, going back to the example, you have to go to the market. There might be places where you have to ride on a motorcycle for a day to get to the hospital. So all of those problems, the logistical issues, are things that really could be worked out a lot better 
And so that's one of the kind of how they're going about it. And the other reason I kind of wanted to mention this to the Herb Societies is, you know, not all of us can afford to make donations to places, but if you are interested in making a donation, you can make it to the Global Snake Bite Initiative. You can just Google that and they have a website. <coughs> I was going to put a screenshot of their website on there, but I failed at that. So um, you can Google it and find it on your own pretty easily. So that's something I thought you guys might be interested in. Oh, and I should mention, um, kind of from here on out, Yeah, touch twice. Touch one, you take it. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, from here on out, uh, if you guys have any questions, um, <clears throat> if I say anything that doesn't make sense, if you're confused, please tell me. All right, I, I want you to understand what I'm trying to talk about, and I don't want to try to talk over your head or anything. So if you're not sure what I mean, please scream, holler, wave your arms, whatever. Okay, so. Uh, Cassien Bon, um, unfortunately, has now passed away, but he was really fabulous. And this talk really helped me to understand the issues with Crofab. So for those of you who are not aware, uh, Crofab is the antivenom that is manufactured for use here in the United States. If you are bitten by a snake in this country and you need antivenom, that's what you're going to get. And um, it is a Fab 1 antivenom. And it is different from pretty much every other antivenom in the world. And this little cartoon here that I've drawn um, is kind of supposed to show how it works. So I'm going to come over here and hopefully not make this change a whole lot. <clears throat> this first row is supposed to be um, Crofeb. The second row is supposed to be pretty much any other antivenom. And if you look at, oh, a pointer. <laughs> All right. <coughs> if you look at an antibody molecule that is made by a horse, or in the case of Crofab, a sheep, that's going to help you if you are bitten by a snake, in the animal, and if you make an antibody in your body, it looks the same way. It looks like a Y. All right? And part of the Y is the part that says, hey, I'm from a horse, or hey, I'm from Lulu, or whoever you happen to be. The other parts of the Y are the parts that grab onto the antigen, whatever it is they're supposed to be taking care of in your body. All right? The, the Y is called an IgG. They can cut off the part that says, hey, I'm from a horse, and it's called a FAB2. And then they can also cut the top of the Y in half, and that's what a FAB1 is. So IgG is the whole thing, FAB2 is missing the identifier part, and FAB1 is just each individual little part that binds to the venom. Everybody with me so far? Okay. All right, so if you look at how Crofab works, here's the little FAB particles, here's a venom particle, so one toxin, and basically what happens is the toxin typically has multiple binding sites on it because the toxins are these really big complex molecules. And so what you get is the toxin with several individual particles of antivenom bonded to it. If you look at the other types of antivenom, so here on the bottom, here's your antibody, here's your toxin, you get this giant mass because each individual anti venom, or antibody, however you want to look at it, can attach in two places. So what that means is if you look at the cartoon here, do you see how it's bound into this gigantic mass? This, the big mass, is much more stable than one toxin with a, some antibodies stuck onto it. And what happens is that it can dissolve and kind of fall apart. Those big giant masses, they take a long time to exit the body. So they're floating around in your body for a long, long time. And as they float around and they run into more venom particles, they're going to pick those up too. And the fact that there's these multiple binding sites in this big giant complex just <laughs> serves to make it more and more